Last Argument of Kings Book 3 of the First Law Series by Joe Abercrombie Read by Stephen Pacey Chapter 34 The Circle Dawn was coming, a grey rumour, the faintest touch of brightness around the solemn outline of the walls of Carleon. The stars had all faded into a stony sky, but the moon still hung there, just above the treetops, seeming almost close enough to try an arrow at. West had not closed his eyes all night, and had passed into that strange realm of twitchy, dreamlike wakefulness that comes beyond exhaustion. Sometime in the silent darkness, after all the orders had been given, he had sat by the light of a single lamp to write a letter to his sister to vomit up excuses, to demand forgiveness. He had sat, he could not have said for how long, with the pen over the paper, but the words had simply not come. He had wanted to say all that he felt, but when it came to it, he felt nothing. The warm taverns of Adua, cards in the sunny courtyard, Ardy's one-sided smile, it all seemed a thousand years ago. The Northmen were already busy clipping at the grass in the shadow of the walls, the clicking of their shears, a strange echo of the gardeners in the Agriont, shaving a circle a dozen strides across down to the roots. The ground, he supposed, on which the duel would take place, the ground where, in no more than an hour or two, the fate of the North would be decided. Very much like a fencing circle, except that it might soon be sprayed with blood. A barbaric custom, muttered Jallenhorn, his thoughts evidently taking a similar course. Really? growled Pike. I was just now thinking what a civilized one it is. Civilized? Two men butchering each other before a crowd? Better than a whole crowd butchering each other? A problem solved with only one man killed? That's a war ended well, to my mind. Jallenhorn shivered and blew into his cupped hands. Still, a lot to hang on two men fighting one another. What if Nine Fingers loses? Then I suppose that Bethod will go free, said West unhappily. But he invaded the Union. He caused the deaths of thousands. He deserves to be punished. People rarely get what they deserve. West thought of Prince Ladislaw's bones rotting out in the wasteland. Some terrible crimes go unpunished, and a few, for no reason beyond the fickle movements of chance, are richly rewarded. He stopped in his tracks. A man was sitting on his own on the long slope, his back to the city. A man hunched over in a battered coat, so still and quiet in the half-light that West had almost missed him. I'll catch you up he said as he left the path. The grass, coated with a pale fur of frost, crunched gently under his boots with each step. Pull up a chair. Breath smoked gently round Nine Fingers' darkened face. West squatted down on the cold earth beside him. Are you ready? Ten times before I've done this. Can't say I've ever yet been ready. Don't know that there is a way to get ready for a thing like this. The best I've worked out is just to sit and let the time crawl past and try not to piss yourself. I imagine a wet crutch could be an embarrassment in the circle. Aye. Better than a split head, though, I reckon. Undeniably true. West had heard tales of these northern duels before, of course. Growing up in Angland, children whispered lurid stories of them to each other but he had little idea how they were really conducted. How does this business work? They mark out a circle. Round the edge men stand with shields, half from one side, half from the other, and they make sure no one leaves before it's settled. Two men go into the circle. The one that dies there is the loser. Unless someone has it in mind to be merciful. Can't see that happening today, though, somehow also undeniable. What do you fight with? Each one of us brings something. Could be anything. 
Then there's a spin of a shield, and the winner picks the weapon he wants. So you might end up fighting with what your enemy brought. It can happen. I killed Shema Heartless with his own sword, and got stuck through with the spear I brought to fight Harding Grimm. He rubbed at his stomach as though the memory ached there. Still, don't hurt any worse, getting stuck with your own spear instead of someone else's. West laid a hand thoughtfully on his own gut. No. They sat in silence for a while longer. There's a favor I'd like to ask you. Name it. Would you and your friends hold shields for me? Us? West blinked towards the carls in the shadow of the wall. Their great round shields looked hard enough to lift, let alone to use well. Are you sure? I've never held one in my life. Maybe. But you know whose side you're on. There ain't many folk among these that I can trust. Most of them are still trying to work out who they hate more, me or Bethod. It only takes one to give me a shove when I need a push, or let me fall when I need catching. Then we're all done. Me especially. West puffed out his cheeks. We'll do what we can. Good. Good. The cold silence dragged out. Over the black hills, the black trees, the moon sank and grew dimmer. Tell me, Furious, do you reckon a man has to pay for the things he's done? West looked up sharply, the irrational and sickly thought flashing through his mind that Nine Fingers was talking of Ardy, or of Ladisla, or both. Certainly, the Northman's eyes seemed to glint with accusation in the half-light. Then West felt the surge of fear subside. Nine Fingers was talking of himself, of course, as everyone always does, given the chance. It was guilt in his eyes, not accusation. Each man has his own mistakes to follow him. Maybe. West cleared his dry throat. Sometimes. I don't know. I suppose we've all done things we regret. Aye, said Nine Fingers. I reckon. They sat together in silence and watched the light leak across the sky. Let's go, Chief, hissed Dow. Let's fucking go. I'll say when. Dogman spat back, holding the dewy branches out of the way and peering towards the walls, a hundred strides off, maybe, across a damp meadow. Too much light now. We'll wait for that bloody moon to drop a touch further, then we'll make a run at it. It ain't gonna get any darker. Bethod can't have too many men left after all the ones we killed up in the mountains, and that's a lot of walls. They'll be spread thin as cobwebs up there. It only takes one to... And Dow was off across that field and running, as plain on the flat grass as a turd on a snowfield. Shit! hissed Dogman, helpless. Huh? said Grim. There was nothing to do but stare and wait for Dow to get stuck full of arrows, wait for the shouts and torches lit and the alarm to go up, and the whole thing dumped right in the shithole. Then Dow dashed up the last bit of slope and was gone into the shadows by the wall. He made it, said Dogman. Eh? said Grim. That ought to have been a good thing, but Dogman didn't feel too much like laughing. He had to make the run himself now, and he didn't have Dow's luck. He looked at Grim, and Grim shrugged. They burst out from the trees together, feet pounding across the soft meadow. Grim had the longer legs, started pulling away. The ground was a good deal softer than Dogman had. God! His foot squelched to the ankle, and he went flying over, splashed down in the mire, and slid along on his face. He floundered up, cold and gasping, ran the rest of the way with his wet shirt plastered against his skin. He stumbled up the slope to the foot of the walls and bent over, hands to his knees, blowing hard and spitting out grass. Looks like you've got a tumble there, Chief. Dow's grin was a white curve in the shadows. You mad bastard! His dogman, his temper flaring up hot in his cold chest. You could have been the deaths of all of us! Oh, there's still time. Shh. 
Grim flailed one hand at them to say keep quiet. Dogman pressed himself tight to the wall, worry snuffing his anger out quick time. He heard men moving up above, saw the glimmer of a lamp pass slow down the walls. He waited, still. No sound but Dow's quiet breath beside him and his own heart pounding, till the men above moved on and all was quiet again. Tell me that ain't got your blood flowing quick, chief, whispered Dow. We're lucky it ain't flowing right out of us. What now? Dogman gritted his teeth as he tried to scrape the mud out of his face. Now we wait. Logan stood up, brushed the dew from his trousers, took a long breath of the chill air. There could be no denying any longer that the sun was well and truly up. It might have been hidden in the east behind Scarling's Hill, but the tall black towers up there had bright golden edges. The thin high clouds were pinking underneath, the cold sky between turning pale blue. Better to do it, Logan whispered under his breath, than live with the fear of it. He remembered his father telling him that, saying it in the smoky hall, light from the fire shifting on his lined face, long finger wagging. Logan remembered telling it to his own son, smiling by the river, teaching him to tickle fish. Father and son, both dead now, earth and ashes. No one would learn it after Logan, once he was gone. No one would miss him much at all, he reckoned. But then who cared? There's nothing worth less than what men think of you after you're back in the mud. He wrapped his fingers round the grip of the maker's sword, felt the scored lines tickling at his palm. He slid it from the sheath and let it hang, worked his shoulders round in circles, jerked his head from side to side. One more cold breath in and out, then he started walking, up through the crowd that had gathered in a wide arc around the gate. A mix of the dogman's carls and Crummock's hillmen, and a few Union soldiers given leave to watch the crazy northerners kill each other. Some called to him as he came through, all knowing there were a lot more lives hanging on this than Logan's own. It's nine fingers. The bloody nine! Put an end to this! Kill that bastard! They had their shields, all the men that Logan had picked to hold them, standing in a solemn knot near the walls. West was one, and Pike, and Red Hat, and Shivers, too. Logan wondered if he'd made a mistake with the last of them, but he'd saved the man's life in the mountains, and that ought to count for something. Ought to was a thin thread to hang your life on, but there it was. His life had been dangling from a thin thread ever since he could remember. Crummocky Fail fell into step beside him, big shield looking small on one big arm, the other hand resting light on his fat belly. You looking forward to this, then, bloody nine? I am, I can tell you that. Hands slapped at his shoulders, voices called encouragement, but Logan said nothing. He didn't look left or right as he pushed past into the shaven circle. He felt men close in behind him, heard them set their shields in a half ring round the edge of the short grass facing the gates of Carleon. Further back, the crowd pressed in tight, whispering to each other, straining to see. No way back now, that was a fact. But then there never had been. He'd been heading here all his days. Logan stopped in the center of the circle, and he turned his face up towards the battlements. It's sunrise, he roared. Let's get to it. There was silence while the echoes died and the wind pushed some loose leaves around the grass. A silence long enough for Logan to start hoping no one would answer, to start hoping they'd all somehow slipped away in the night and there'd be no duel after all. Then faces appeared on the walls, one here, one there, then a whole crowd lining the parapet far as Logan could see in both directions. Hundreds of folk, fighting men, women, children even, up on shoulders. Everyone in the city, it looked like. Metal squealed and wood creaked, and the tall gates ever so slowly swung apart, 
the glare of the rising sun spilling out the crack between, then pouring bright through the open archway. Two lines of men came tramping out. Carls, all hard faces and tangled hair, heavy mail jingling, painted shields on their arms. Logan knew a few of them, some of Bethod's closest, who'd been with him since the beginning. Hard men all, who'd held the shields for Logan more than once back in the old days. They formed up in their own half-ring, closing the circle tight. A wall of shields. Animal faces, trees and flowers, flowing water, crossed axes, all of them scarred and scuffed from a hundred old fights. All of them turned in towards Logan. A cage of men and wood, and the only way out was to kill. Or to die, of course. A black shape formed in the bright archway, like a man, but taller, seeming to fill it all the way to the high keystone. Logan heard footsteps, thumping footsteps, heavy as falling anvils. A strange kind of fear tugged at him, a mindless panic, as if he'd woken trapped under the snow again. He forced himself not to look over his shoulder at Crummock, forced himself to look ahead as Bethod's champion stepped out into the dawn. By the fucking dead, breathed Logan. He thought at first it must be some trick of the light that made him look the size he did. Tull Duru Thunderhead had been a big bastard, no doubt, big enough that some had called him a giant. But he'd still looked like a man. Fenris the Feared was built on such a scale that he seemed something else, a race apart. A giant, indeed, stepped out from old stories and made flesh. A lot of flesh. His face squirmed as he walked, great bald head jerking from side to side. His mouth sneered and grinned, his eyes winked and bulged by turns. One half of him was blue, no other way to put it. A neat line down his face divided blue skin from pale. His huge right arm was white, his left was blue all the long way from shoulder to the tips of his great fingers. In that hand he carried a sack, swinging back and forward with each step, bulging as if it was stuffed with hammers. A couple of Bethod shield carriers cringed out of his way, looking like children beside him, grimacing as if death itself was breathing on their necks. The feared stepped through into the circle, and Logan saw the blue marks were writing, just as the spirit had told him. Twisted symbols scrawled over every part of his left side, hand, arm, face, lips even. The words of Glustrod, written in the old time. The feared stopped a few strides distant, and a sickly horror seemed to wash out from him and over the silent crowd, as if a great weight was pressing on Logan's chest, squeezing out his courage. But the task was simple enough in its way. If the feared's painted side couldn't be harmed, Logan would just have to carve the rest of him and carve it deep. He'd beaten some hard men in the circle, ten of the hardest bastards in all the North. This was just one more. Or so he tried to tell himself. Where's Bethod? He'd meant to bellow it, all defiance, but it came out a tame, dry squawk. I can watch you die just as well from up here. The King of the Northmen stood on the battlements above the open gate, well-groomed and happy. Pale as snow, and a few guards stood about him. If he'd had any trouble sleeping, Logan would never have known it. The morning breeze stirred his hair and the thick fur round his shoulders. The morning sun shone on the golden chain, struck sparks from the diamond on his brow. Glad you came. I was worried you'd make a run for it. He gave a carefree sigh, and it smoked on the sharp air. It's morning, like you said. Let's get started. Logan looked into the feared's bulging, twisting, crazy eyes and swallowed. We're gathered here to win us a challenge, roared Crummock. A challenge to put an end to this war. 
and settle the blood between Bathod, who's taken to calling himself King of the Northman, and Furious, who speaks for the Union. Bathod wins, the siege is lifted, and the Union leaves the North. Furious wins, then the gates of Corleon are opened, and Bathod stands at his mercy. Do I speak true? You do, said West, his voice sounding small in all that space. Aye. Up on his walls, Bethod waved a lazy hand. Get to it, fat men. Then name yourselves, champions, shouted Crummock. Unless your pedigree. Logan took a step forward. It was a hard step to take, as if he was pushing against a great wind, but he took it, tilted his head back, and looked the feared full in his writhing face. I'm the bloody nine, and there's no number on the men I've killed. The words came out soft and dead, no pride in his empty voice, but no fear either, a cold fact, cold as the winter. Ten challenges I've given and I won them all. In this circle I beat Shamer Heartless, Rudd Three Trees, Harding Grim, Tull Duru Thunderhead, Black Dow, and more besides. If I listed the named men I've put back in the mud, we'd be here at sunrise tomorrow. There's not a man in the North don't know my work. Nothing changed in the giant's face, nothing more than usual, at least. My name is Fenris the Feared. My achievements are all in the past. He held up his painted hand and squeezed the great fingers, and the sinews in his huge blue arm bulged like knotted tree roots. With these signs, great Glustrod marked me out his chosen. With this hand, I tore down the statues of Alcus. Now... I kill little men in little wars. Logan could just make out a tiny shrug of his massive shoulders. Such is the way of things. Crummock looked at Logan, and he raised his brows. All right, then. What weapons have you carried to the fight? Logan lifted the heavy sword forged by Canadius for his war against the Magi and held it up to the light. A stride of dull metal, the edge glittered faintly in the pale sunrise. This blade. He stabbed it down into the earth between them and left it standing there. The feared threw his sack rattling down, and it sagged open. Inside were great black plates, spiked and studded, scarred and battered. This armor. Logan looked at that vast weight of dark iron and licked his teeth. If the feared won the spin, he could take the sword and leave Logan with a pile of useless armor way too big for him. What would he do then? Hide under it? He only had to hope his luck stuck out a few minutes longer. All right, my beauties. Crummock set his shield down on its rim and took hold of the edge. Painted or plain, Nine Fingers? painted. Crummock ripped the shield round and set it spinning. Round and round it went, painted, plain, painted, plain. Hope and despair swapped with every turn. The wood started to slow, to wobble on its rim. It dropped down flat, plain side up, the straps flopping. So much for luck. Crummock winced. He looked up at the giant. You got a choice, big lad. The feared took hold of the maker's blade and slid it from the earth. It looked like a toy in his monstrous hand. His bulging eyes rolled up to Logan's, and his great mouth twisted into a smile. He tossed the sword down at Logan's feet, and it dropped in the dirt. Take your knife, little man. The sound of raised voices floated thin on the breeze. All right hissed Dow, much too loud for the dogman's nerves. They're getting started. I can hear that, dogman snapped, coiling the rope round and round into easy circles ready to throw. 
You know what you're doing with that? I could do without it dropping on me. That's so. Dogman swung the grapple back and forward a touch, feeling the weight. I was just thinking that after it's sticking in that wall, it's sticking in your fat head was the second best outcome. He spun it round in a circle, then a wider one, letting some rope slip through his hand, then he hefted it all the way and let it fly. It sailed up real neat, the rope uncoiling after it and over the battlements. Dogman winced as he heard it clatter on the walkway, but no one came. He pulled on the rope. A stride or two slid down, and then it caught, felt firm as a rock. First time, said Grim. Dogman nodded, hardly able to believe it himself. What are the odds? Who's first? Dow grinned at him. Whoever's got hold of the rope now, I reckon. As the dogman started climbing, he found he was going over all the ways a man could get killed going up this wall. Grapple slipped and he fell. Rope frayed and snapped and he fell. Someone had seen the grapple, was waiting for him to get to the top before they cut the rope. Or they were waiting for him to get to the top before they cut his throat. Or they were just now calling for a dozen big men to take prisoner whatever idiot it was trying to climb into a city on his own. His boots scuffled at the rough stone, the hemp bit at his hands, his arms burned at the work, and all the while he did his best to keep his rasping breath quiet. The battlements edged closer, then closer, then he was there. He hooked his fingers onto the stone and peered over. The walkway was empty, both ways. He slipped over the parapet, sliding a knife out, just in case. You can never have too many knives and all that. He checked the grapple was caught firm, then he leaned over, saw Dow at the bottom looking up, Grim with the rope in his hands, one foot on the wall, ready to climb. Dogman beckoned to him to say, come, watched him start up, hand over hand, Dow holding to the bottom of the rope to stop it flapping. Soon enough, he was halfway. What the fuck? Dogman jerked his head left. There were a pair of thralls not far off, just stepped out from a door to the nearest tower and onto the wall. They stared at him, and he stared back. Seemed like the longest time. There's a rope here, he shouted, brandishing his knife around and making like he was trying to cut it away from the grapple. Some bastard's trying to climb in. By the dead! One came running, gawped down at Grimm swinging around. He's coming up now! The other one pulled his sword out. Don't worry about that. He lifted it, grinning, ready to chop through the rope. Then he stopped. Here. Why are you all muddy? Dogman stabbed him in the chest, hard as he could, and again. Yeah! wailed the thrall, face screwed up, lurching back against the battlements and dropping his sword over the side. His mate came charging up, swinging a big mace. Dogman ducked under it, but the thrall barreled into him and brought him down on his back, head cracking on stone. The mace clattered away, and they wrestled around, the thrall kicking and punching, while Dogman tried to get his hands round his throat, stop him from calling out. They rolled over one way, then back the other, struggled up to standing, and tottered about down the walkway. The thrall got his shoulder in Dogman's armpit and shoved him back up against the battlements, trying to bundle him over. Shit! gasped the dogman as his feet left the ground. He could feel his ass scraping the stone, but still he clung on, hands tight round the thrall's neck, stopping him getting a good breath. He went up another inch, felt his head forced back, almost more weight on the wrong side of the parapet than the right. Over you go, you fucker! croaked the thrall, working his chin away from dogman's hands and pushing him a touch further. Over you! His eyes went wide. He stumbled back, a shaft sticking out of his side. Oh, I don't! Another thumped into his neck, and he lurched a step, would have fallen off the back of the wall if the dogman hadn't grabbed his arm and dragged him down onto the walkway, held him there while he slobbered his last breaths. When he was finished, dogman rolled up and stood bent over the corpse, breathing. Grim hurried over, taking a good look around to make sure no one else was likely to happen by. All right. Just once. 
Just once, I'd like to get the help before I'm at the point of getting killed. Better than after. The dogman had to admit there was some truth to that. He watched Dow pull himself over the battlements and roll down onto the walkway. The thrall dogman had stabbed was still breathing, just about, sat near the grapple. Dow chopped a piece out of his skull with his axe as he walked past, careless as if he was chopping logs. He shook his head. I leave the two of you alone for ten breaths together, and look what happens. Two dead men, eh? Dow leaned down, stuck two fingers in one of the holes Dogman's knife had made, pulled them out, and smeared blood across one side of his face. He grinned up. What do you reckon we can do with two dead men? The fear seemed to fill the circle, one half bare and blue, the other cased in black iron, a monster torn free from legends. There was nowhere to hide from his great fists, nowhere to hide from the fear of him. Shields rattled and clashed, men roared and bellowed, a sea of blurred faces twisted with mad fury. Logan crept around the edge of the short grass, trying to keep light on his feet. He might have been smaller, but he was quicker, cleverer. At least he hoped he was. He had to be, or he was mud. Keep moving, rolling, ducking, stay out of the way and pick his moment. Above all, don't get hit. Not getting hit was the first thing. The giant came at him out of nowhere, his great tattooed fist a blue blur. Logan threw himself out of the way, but it still grazed his cheek and caught his shoulder, sent him stumbling. So much for not getting hit. A shield, and not a friendly one, shoved him in the back, and he lurched the other way, head whipping forward. He pitched on his face, nearly cut himself on his own sword, rolled desperately to the side, and saw the feared's huge boot thud into the ground, soil flying where his skull had been a moment before. Logan scrabbled up in time to see the blue hand coming at him again. He ducked underneath it, hacked at the feared's tattooed flesh as he reeled past. The maker's sword thudded deep into the giant's thigh like a spade into turf. The huge leg buckled, and he dropped forward onto his armoured knee. It should have been a killing blow, right through the big veins, but there was hardly more blood than from a shaving scratch. Still, if one thing fails, you try another. Logan roared as he chopped at the feared's bald head. The blade clanged against the armour on the giant's right arm, raised just in time. It scraped down that black steel and slid off, harmless, chopping into the earth and leaving Logan's hands buzzing. Move! The feared's knees sank into his gut, folded him up and sent him staggering, needing to cough but not having the air to do it. The giant had already found his feet again, armoured hand swinging back, a lump of black iron the size of a man's head. Logan dived sideways, rolling across the short grass, felt the wind of the great arm ripping past him. It crashed into the shield where he'd been standing, broke it into splintered pieces, flung the man holding it, wailing into the earth. It seemed the spirit had been right. The painted side couldn't be hurt. Logan crouched, waiting for the clawing pain in his stomach to fade enough for him to breathe, trying to think of some trick to use and coming up with nothing. The feared turned his writhing face towards Logan. Behind him on the ground, the felled man whimpered under the wreckage of his shield. The carls either side of him shuffled in to close the gap with some reluctance. The giant took a slow step forwards, and Logan took a painful step back. Still alive, he whispered to himself. But how long for, it was hard to say. West had never in his life felt so scared, so exhilarated, so very much alive. Not even when he won the contest with all the wide square of marshals cheering for him. Not even when he stormed the walls of Ulriok and burst out from the dust and chaos into the warm sunlight. His skin tingled with hope and horror. His hands jerked helplessly with nine fingers movements. His lips murmured pointless advice, silent encouragement. Beside him, Pike and Jallenhorn jostled, shoved, shouted themselves hoarse. 
Behind them, the wide crowd roared, straining to see. On the walls, they leaned out, screaming and shaking their fists in the air. The circle of men flexed with the movements of the fighters, never still, bowing out and sucking in as the champions came forward or fell back. And almost always, so far, the one falling back was Nine Fingers. A great brute of a man by most standards, he seemed tiny, weak, and brittle in that terrifying company. To make matters a great deal worse, there was something very strange at work here, something West could only have called magic. Great wounds, deadly wounds, closed in the feared's blue skin before his very eyes. This thing was not a man. It could only be a devil. And whenever it towered over him, West felt a fear as though he was standing at the very verge of hell. West grimaced as Nine Fingers lurched helplessly against the shields on the far side of the circle. The feared raised his armored fist to deliver a blow that could surely crush a skull to jelly. But it hit nothing but air. Nine Fingers jerked away at the last moment and let the iron miss his jaw by a hair. His heavy sword slashed down, bounced off the feared's armored shoulder with a resounding clang. The giant stumbled back, and Nine Fingers came after him, pale scars stretched on his rigid face. Yes! hissed West, the men around him bellowing their approval. The next blow shrieked down the giant's armored side, leaving a long, bright scratch and digging up a great sod of earth. The last chopped deep into his painted ribs and spat out a misty spray of blood, knocked him flailing off balance. West's mouth opened wide as the great shadow fell across him. The feared toppled against his shield like a falling tree and drove him trembling to his knees, wilting under the great weight, his stomach rolling with horror and disgust. Then he saw it. One of the buckles on the spiked and studded armor just below the giant's knee was inches from the fingers of West's free hand. All he could think of in that moment was that Bethod might escape after all the dead men he had left scattered up and down the length of Angland. He gritted his teeth and snatched hold of the end of the leather strap, thick as a man's belt. He dragged at it as the feared shoved his huge bulk up. The buckle came jingling open, the armor on the mighty calf flapped loose as his foot thumped down again, as his arm lashed out and knocked nine fingers stumbling away. West struggled from the dirt, already greatly regretting his impulsiveness. He glanced around the circle, searching for any sign that someone had seen him, but all eyes were fixed on the fighters. It seemed now a tiny, petulant sort of sabotage that could never make the slightest difference, beyond getting him killed, of course. It was a fact he had known from childhood. Catch you cheating in a northern duel, and they'll cut the bloody cross in you and pull your guts out. Gah! Logan jerked away from the armored fist, tottered to his right as the blue one rushed past his face, dived to his left as the iron hand lashed at him again, slid, and nearly fell. Any one of those blows had been hard enough to take his head off. He saw the painted arm go back, gritted his teeth as he dodged around another of the feared's mighty punches, already swinging the sword up and over. The blade sheared neatly through the blue arm just below the elbow, sent it tumbling away across the circle along with a gout of blood. Logan heaved air into his burning lungs and raised the maker's sword high, setting himself for one last effort. The feared's eyes rolled up towards the dull gray blade. He jerked his head to one side and it chopped deep into his painted skull, showering out specks of dark blood and splitting his head down to the eyebrow. The giant's armored elbow crunched into Logan's ribs, half lifted him off his feet and flung him kicking across the circle. He bounced from a shield and sprawled on his face, lay there spitting out dirt while the blurry world spun around him. He winced as he pushed himself up, blinked the tears out of his eyes, and froze. The feared stepped forward, sword still buried deep in his skull, and picked up his severed arm. He pressed it against the bloodless stump, twisted it to the right, then back to the left, 
and let it go. The great forearm was whole again. The letters ran from shoulder to wrist unbroken. The men around the circle fell silent. The giant worked his blue fingers for a moment, then he reached up and closed his hand around the hilt of the maker's sword. He turned it one way, then the other, his skull crunching as bone shifted. He dragged the blade free, shook his head as if to clear a touch of dizziness. Then he tossed the sword across the circle, and it clattered down in front of Logan for the second time that day. Logan stared at it, his chest heaving. It was getting heavier with each exchange. The wounds he'd taken in the mountains ached, the blows he'd taken in the circle throbbed. The air was still cold, but his shirt was sticky with sweat. The feared showed no sign of tiring, even with half a ton of iron strapped to his body. There wasn't so much as a bead of sweat on his twisting face, not so much as a scratch on his tattooed scalp. Logan felt the fear pressing hard on him again. He knew now how the mouse felt when the cat had him between his paws. He should have run. He should have run and never looked back. But instead, he'd chosen this. Say one thing for Logan Ninefingers. Say that bastard never learns. The giant's mouth crawled up into a wriggling smile. More, he said. Dogman needed to piss as he walked up to the gate of Carleon's inner wall, always needed to piss at times like this. He had one of the dead thrall's clothes on, big enough that he'd had to pull the belt too tight, cloak hanging over the bloody knife hole in the shirt. Grim was wearing the other's gear, bow over one shoulder, the big mace hanging from his free hand. Dow slumped between them, wrists tied at his back, feet scraping stupidly at the cobbles, bloody head hanging like they'd given him quite the beating. Seemed a pitiful kind of a ruse, if the dogman was being honest. There were fifty things he'd counted since they climbed off the walls that could have given them away. But there was no time for anything cleverer. Talk well and smile, and no one would notice the clues. That's what he hoped, anyway. A guard stood each side of the wide archway, a pair of carls in long mail coats and helmets, both with spears in their hands. What's this? one asked, frowning as they walked up close. Found this bastard trying to creep in. Dogman gave Dow a punch in the side of the head, just to make things look good. We're taking him down below. Lock him up till after they're done. He made to walk on past. One of the guards stopped him cold with a hand on his chest, and the dogman swallowed. The carl nodded towards the city's gates. How's it going down there? All right, I guess. Dogman shrugged. It's going, anyway. Bathard'll come out on top, eh? He always does, don't he? I don't know. The carl shook his head. That feared puts the fucking wind up me. Him and that bloody witch. Can't say I'll cry too hard if the bloody nine kills the pair of them. The other one chuckled, pushed his helmet onto the back of his scalp, bringing up a cloth to wipe the sweat underneath. You got a... Dow sprang forward, loose bits of rope flapping round his wrists, and buried a knife all the way up to the hilt in the carl's forehead. Dropped him like a chair with the legs kicked away. Same moment, almost, Grimm's borrowed mace clonked into the top of the other's helmet and left a great dent in it, jammed the rim right down almost to the tip of his nose. He dribbled some, stumbling back like he was drunk. Then blood came bubbling out of his ears, and he fell down on his back. Dogman turned round, trying to hold his stolen cloak out so no one would see Dow and Grimm dragging the two corpses away, but the town seemed empty. Everyone watching the fight, no doubt. He wondered for a moment what was happening out there in the circle, long enough to get a nasty feeling in his gut. Come on. He turned to see Dow grinning all across his bloody face. The two bodies he'd just wedged behind the gates, one of them staring cross-eyed at the knife hole in his head. That good enough? asked Dogman. What, you want to say a few words for the dead, do you? You know what I mean. If someone... No time for clever now. Dow grabbed him by the arm and pulled him through the gate. 
It's kill us a witch. The sole of the feared's metal boot thudded into Logan's chest, ripped his breath out, and rammed him into the earth, the sword tumbling from his clawing hand, puke burning at the back of his throat. Before he knew where he was, a great shadow fell across him. Metal snapped shut round his wrist, tight as a vice. His legs were kicked away, and he was on his face, arm twisted behind him, and a mouthful of dirt to think about. Something pressed against his cheek. Cold at first, then painful. The feared's great foot. His wrist was wrenched round, dragged up. His head was crushed further into the damp ground, short grass prickling up his nose. The tearing pain in his shoulder was awful. Soon it was a lot worse. He was caught fast and helpless, stretched out like a rabbit for skinning. The crowd had fallen breathlessly silent, the only sound the battered flesh round Logan's mouth squelching, the air squeaking in one squashed nostril. He would have screamed if his face hadn't been so squeezed that he could scarcely wheeze in half a breath. Say one thing for Logan Ninefingers. Say that he's finished. Back to the mud, and no one could have said he hadn't earned it. A fitting end for the bloody nine, torn apart in the circle. But the great arms didn't pull any further. Out the corner of one flickering eye, Logan could just see Bethod leaning against the battlements. The King of the Northmen waved his hand round and round in a slow wheel. Logan remembered what it meant. Take your time. Make it last. Show them all a lesson they'll never forget. The feared's great boot slid off his jaw, and Logan felt himself dragged into the air, limbs flopping like a puppet with the strings cut. The tattooed hand went up, black against the sun, and slapped Logan across the face open-handed, as a father might cuff a troublesome child. It was like being hit with a pan. Light burst open in Logan's skull, his mouth filled with blood. Things drew into focus just in time for him to see the painted hand swing back the other way. It came down with a terrible inevitability and cracked him a backhand blow, as a jealous husband might crack his helpless wife. <laughs> he heard himself say, and he was flying. Blue sky, blinding sun, yellow grass, staring faces, all meaningless smears. He crashed into the shields at the edge of the circle, flopped half senseless to the earth. Far away, men were shouting, screaming, hissing, but he couldn't hear the words and hardly cared. All he could think about was the cold feeling in his stomach as if his guts were stuffed with swelling ice. He saw a pale hand smeared with pink blood, white tendons starting from the scratched skin. His hand, of course. There was the stump. But when he tried to make the fingers open, they only clutched tighter at the brown earth. Yes, he whispered, and blood drooled out of his numb mouth and trickled into the grass. The ice spread out from his stomach, out to the very tips of his fingers, and turned every part of him numb. It was well that it did. It was high time. Yes, he said. Up, up onto one knee, his bloody lips curling back from his teeth, his bloody right hand snaking through the grass, seeking out the hilt of the maker's sword, closing tight around it. Yes, he hissed. And Logan laughed, and the Bloody Nine laughed together. West had not expected Nine Fingers to get up, not ever again. But he did, and when he did, he was laughing. It sounded almost like weeping at first, a slobbering giggle, shrill and strange. But it grew louder, sharper, colder as he rose as if at a cruel joke that no one else could see. A fatal joke. His head fell sideways like a hanged man's, livid face all slack around a hacked-out grin. Blood stained his teeth pink, trickled from the cuts on his face, seeped from his torn lips. The laughter gurgled up louder and louder, ripping at West's ears, jagged as a saw blade. More agonized than any scream, more furious than any war cry. 
awfully, sickeningly wrong, chuckling at a massacre, slaughterhouse giggling. Nine fingers lurched forwards like a drunken man, swaying, wild, sword dangling from his bloody fist. His dead eyes glittered, wet and staring, pupils swollen to two black pits. His mad laughter cut and grated and hacked around the circle. West felt himself edging back, mouth dry. All the crowd edged back. They no longer knew who scared them more, Fenris the feared or the bloody nine. The world burned. His skin was on fire. His breath was scalding steam. The sword was a brand of molten metal in his fist. The sun stamped white-hot patterns into his prickling eyes, and the cold grey shapes of men and shields and walls, and of a giant made from blue words and black iron. Fear washed out from him in sickly waves, but the bloody nine only smiled the wider. Fear and pain were fuel on the fire, and the flames surged high and higher yet. The world burned, and at its center the Bloody Nine burned hottest of all. He held out his hand, and he curled the three fingers, and he beckoned. I am waiting, he said. The great fist slashed at the Bloody Nine's face, the great hands snatched at his body, but all the giant caught was laughter. Easier to strike the flickering fire, easier to catch the rolling smoke. The circle was an oven. The blades of yellow grass were tongues of yellow flame beneath it. The sweat, spit, blood dripped onto it like gravy from cooking meat. The bloody nine made a hiss, water on coals. The hiss became a growl, iron spattering from the forge. The growl became a great roar, the dry forest in flames, and he let the sword go free. The grey metal made searing circles, hacked bloodless holes in blue flesh, rang on black iron. The giant faded away, and the blade bit into the face of one of the men holding the shields. His head burst apart and sprayed blood across another, a hole torn from the wall around the circle. The others shuffled back, shields wavering, the circle swelling with their fear. They feared him more even than the giant and they were wise to. Everything that lived was his enemy, and when the Bloody Nine had made pieces of this devil thing, he would set to work on them. The circle was a cauldron. On the walls above, the crowd surged like angry steam. The ground shifted and swelled under the Bloody Nine's feet like boiling oil. His roar became a scolding scream. The sword flashed down and clashed from spiked armor like a hammer on the anvil. The giant pressed his blue hand to the pale side of his head, face squirming like a nest of maggots. The blade had missed his skull, but stolen away the top half of his ear. Blood bubbled out from the wound, ran down the side of his great neck in two thin lines, and did not stop. The great eyes went wide, and the giant sprang forward with a thundering bellow. The bloody nine rolled under his flailing fist and slid round behind him, saw the black iron on his leg flap away, the bright buckle dangling. The sword snaked out and slid into the gap, ate deep into the great pale calf inside it. The giant roared in pain, spun, lurched on his wounded leg, and fell to his knees. The circle was a crucible. The screaming faces of the men around its edge danced like smoke, swam like molten metal, their shields melting together. Now was the time. The morning sun blazed down, glinted bright on the heavy chest plate marking the spot. Now was the beautiful moment. The world burned, and like a leaping flame, the bloody nine reared up, arching back, raising high the sword. The work of Canadius, the master maker, no blade forged sharper. Its bitter edge scored a long gash in the black armor, through the iron and into the soft flesh beneath, striking sparks and spattering blood, the shriek of tortured metal mingling with the wail of pain torn from the feared's twisted mouth. The wound it left in him was deep, but not deep enough. 
The giant's great arms slid round the bloody nine's back, folding him in a smothering embrace. The edges of the black metal pierced his flesh in a dozen places. Closer the giant drew him, and closer, and a ragged spike slid into the bloody nine's face, cut through his cheek and scraped against his teeth, bit into the side of his tongue and filled his mouth with salt blood. The feared's grip was the weight of mountains. No matter how hot the Bloody Nine's rage, no matter how he squirmed and thrashed and screamed in fury, he was held as tightly as the cold earth holds the buried dead. The blood trickling from his face and from his back and from the great gash in the feared's armor soaked into his clothes and spread out blazing hot over his skin. The world burned. Above the oven, the cauldron, the crucible, Bethod nodded, and the giant's cold arms squeezed tighter. Dogman followed his nose. It rarely led him wrong, his nose, and he hoped to hell that it didn't fail him now. It was a sickly kind of a smell, like sweet cakes left too long in the oven. He led the others along an empty hallway, down a shadowy stair, creeping through the damp darkness in the knotty bowels of Scarling's Hill. He could hear something now, as well as smell it, and it sounded as bad as it smelled. A woman's voice, singing soft and low. A strange kind of singing, in no tongue the dogman could understand. That must be her, muttered Dow. Don't like the sound of that one bit, dogman whispered back. Sounds like magic. Would you expect? She's a fucking witch, ain't she? I'll go round behind. No, oh, wait on. But Dow was already creeping off the other way, boots padding soft and silent. Shit. Dogman followed the smell, creeping down the passageway with Grim at his back, the chanting coming louder and louder. A streak of light slunk out from an archway, and he eased towards it, pressed his side to the wall, and took a peer round the corner. The room on the other side had about as witchy a look as a room could ever have. Dark and windowless, three other black doorways round the walls. It was lit just by one smoky brazier up at the far end, sizzling coals shedding a dirty red light on it all, giving off a sick sweet stink. There were jars and pots scattered all around, bundles of twigs and grass and dried-out flowers hanging from the greasy rafters, casting strange shadows into the corners, like the shapes of hanged men swinging. There was a woman standing over the brazier with her back to the dogman. Her long white arms were spread out wide, shining with sweat. Gold glinted round her thin wrists, black hair straggled down her back. The dogman might not have known the words she was singing, but he could guess it was some dark work she was up to. Grim held up his bow, one eyebrow raised. Dogman shook his head, silently drew his knife. Tricky to kill her right off with the shaft, and who knew what she might do once she was shot. Cold steel in the neck left nothing to chance. Together they crept into the room. The air was hot in there thick as swamp water. Dogman sneaked forward, trying not to breathe, sure the reek would throttle him if he did. He sweated, or the room did. Leastways, his skin was beaded up with dew in no time. He picked his steps, finding a path between all the rubbish strewn across the floor, boxes, bundles, bottles. He worked his damp palm round the grip of his knife, fixed his eyes on the point between her shoulders, the point he'd stab it into. His foot caught a jar and sent it clattering. The woman's head jerked round, the chant stopped dead on her lips. A gaunt, white face, pale as a drowned man's, black paint round her narrow eyes, blue eyes, cold as the ocean. The circle was silent. The men around its edge were still, their faces and their shields hanging limp. The crowd at their backs, the people pressed to the parapet above, all held motionless, all quiet as the dead. For all of Nine Fingers' mad rage, for all his twisting and his struggling, the giant had him fast. 
Thick muscles squirmed under blue skin as the feared's great arms tightened and slowly crushed the life from him. West's mouth was bitter with helpless disappointment. All that he had done, all that he had suffered, all those lives lost for nothing. Bethod would go free. Then Nine Fingers gave an animal growl. The feared held him still, but his blue arm was trembling with the effort, as if he was suddenly weakened and could squeeze no further. Every sinew of West's own body was rigid as he watched. The thick strap of the shield bit into his palm. His jaw was clenched so tight that his teeth ached. The two fighters were locked together, straining against each other with every fibre, and yet entirely still, frozen in the centre of the circle. The dogman sprang forward, knife raised and ready. Stop! He froze solid in a moment. He'd never heard a voice like it. One word, and there was no thought in his head. He stared at the pale woman, his mouth open, his breath hardly moving, wishing that she'd say another. You too, she said, glancing over at Grimm, and his face went slack, and he grinned, halfway through drawing his bow. She looked Dogman up and down, then pouted as if she was all disappointment. Is that any way? for guests to behave. Dogman blinked. What the hell had he been thinking, barging in here with a drawn blade? He couldn't believe he'd done such a thing. He blushed to the roots of his hair. Oh, I'm sorry, by the dead. Beer, said Grimm, throwing his bow into the corner of the room as if he'd suddenly realized he had a turd in his hand, then staring down at the arrow, baffled. That's better. She smiled, and the dogman found he was grinning like an idiot. Some spit might have come out of his mouth, maybe, just a bit, but he weren't that bothered. As long as she kept talking, nothing else seemed of too much importance. She beckoned to them, long white fingers stroking at the thick air. No need to stand so far away from me. Come closer. Him and Grimm stumbled towards her like eager children, Dogman near tripping over his feet in his hurry to please, Grimm barging into a table on the way and coming close to falling on his face. My name is Kaurib. Oh, said Dogman. Most beautiful name ever, no doubt about it. Amazing that a single word could be so beautiful. Harding Grimm's my name. Dogman, they call me, count of a sharp sense of smell, and, uh, By the dead, but it was hard to think straight. There'd been something important he was meant to be doing, but for the life of him he couldn't think what. Dogman. Perfect. Her voice was soothing as a warm bath, as a soft kiss, as milk and honey. Don't sleep yet. Dogman's head rolled, Kaurib's painted face, a black and white blur, swimming in front of him. Sorry, he gurgled, blushing again and trying to hide the knife behind his back. Right sorry about the blade. No idea what— Don't worry. I'm glad that you brought it. I think it would be best if you used it to stab your friend. M? Dogman squinted at Grim. Grim grinned and nodded back at him. I definitely. Right, right, good idea. Dogman lifted up the knife, seeming to weigh a ton. Uh, anywhere you'd like him stabbed in particular? In the heart will do nicely. Right you are, right, the heart it is. Grimm turned front on to give him a better go at it. Dogman blinked, wiped some sweat from his forehead. Here we go, then. Damn it, but he was dizzy. He squinted at Grimm's chest, wanting to make sure he got it right first time and didn't embarrass himself again. Here we go. Now, she hissed at him. Just get it 
The axe blade made a clicking sound as it split her head neatly down the middle, all the way to her chin. Blood sprayed out and spattered in Dogman's gawping face, and the witch's thin body slumped down on the stones like it was made of nothing but rags. Dow frowned as he twisted the haft of his axe this way and that, until the blade came free of Kaurab's ruined skull with a faint sucking sound. That bitch talks too much, he grunted. The bloody nine felt the change, like the first green shoot of spring, like the first warmth on the wind as the summer comes. There was a message in the way the feared held him. His bones were no longer groaning, threatening to burst apart. The giant's strength was less, and his was more. The bloody nine sucked in the air, and his rage burned hot as ever. Slowly, slowly, he dragged his face away from the giant's shoulder, felt the metal slide out from his mouth. He twisted, twisted, until his neck was free, until he was staring into the giant's writhing face. The bloody nine smiled. Then he darted forward, fast as a shower of sparks, and sank his teeth deep into that big lower lip. The giant grunted, shifted his arms, tried to drag the bloody nine's head away, tear the biting teeth out of his mouth. But he could more easily have shaken off the plague. His arms loosened, and the bloody nine twisted the hand that held the maker's sword. He twisted it as the snake twists in its nest, and slowly he began to work it free. The giant's blue left arm uncoiled from the bloody nine's body. His blue hand seized hold of the bloody nine's wrist, but there could be no stopping it. When the sapling seed finds a crack in the mountain, over long years its deep roots will burst the very rock apart. So the bloody nine strained with every muscle and let the slow time pass, hissing out his hatred into the feared's twitching mouth. The blade crept onwards, slowly, slowly, and its very point bit into painted flesh just below the giant's bottom rib. The bloody nine felt the hot blood trickling down the grip and over his bunched fist, trickling out of the feared's mouth and into his, running down his neck, leaking from the wounds across his back, dripping to the ground, just as it should be. Softly, gently, the blade slid into the feared's tattooed body, sideways, upwards, onwards. The great hands clawed at the bloody nine's arm, at his back, seeking desperately for some hold that might stop the terrible easing forward of that blade. But with every moment, the giant's strength melted away, like ice before a furnace. Easier to stop the white flow than to stop the bloody nine. The movement of his hands was the growing of a mighty tree, one hair's breadth at a time, but no flesh, no stone, no metal could stop it. The giant's painted side could not be harmed. Great Glustrod had made it so long years ago, in the old time, when the words were written upon the feared skin. But Glustrod wrote on one half only. Slowly now, softly, gently, the point of the Maker's sword crossed the divide and into the unmarked half of him, dug into his innards, spitted him like meat made ready for the fire. The giant made a great high shriek, and the last strength melted from his hands. The bloody nine opened his jaws and let him free, one arm holding tight to his back while the other drove the sword on into him. The bloody nine hissed laughter through his clenched teeth, dribbled laughter through the ragged hole in his face. He rammed the blade as far as it would go, and its point slid out between the plates of armor just beneath the giant's armpit and glinted red in the sun. Fenris the feared tottered backwards, still making his long squeal, his mouth hanging open, and a string of red spit dangling from his lip, the painted half already healed over, the pale half tattered as mincemeat. The circle of men watched him, frozen, gaping over the tops of their shields. 
His feet shuffled in the dirt, one hand fumbling for the red hilt of the maker's sword, buried to the crosspiece in his side, blood dripping from the pommel and leaving red spots scattered across the ground. His squeal became a rattling groan. One foot tripped the other, and he toppled like a felled tree and crashed over on his back in the center of the circle, great arms and legs spread wide. The twitching of his face was finally still, and there was a long silence. By the dead. It was spoken softly, thoughtfully. Logan squinted into the morning sun, saw the black shape of a man looking down at him from the high gatehouse. By the dead. I never thought you'd do it. The world tipped from side to side as Logan began to walk, the breath hissing cold through the wound in his face, scraping in his raw throat. The men who'd made the circle moved out of his way now, their voices fallen silent, their shields hanging from their hands. Never thought you could do it, but when it comes to killing, there's no man better, no man worse. I've always said so. Logan tottered through the open gates, found an archway, and began to climb the lurching steps, round and round, his boots hissing against the stone and leaving dark smears behind. The blood dripped, tap, 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 from the dangling fingers of his left hand. Every muscle ached. Bethod's voice dug at him. But I get the last laugh, a eh, bloody nine? You're nothing but leaves on the water. Any way the rain washes you. Logan stumbled on, ribs burning, jaws locked tight together, shoulders scraping against the curved wall. Up and up and round and round, his crackling breath echoing after. You'll never have anything. You'll never be anything. You'll never make anything but corpses. Out onto the roof, blinking in the morning brightness, spitting a mouthful of blood over his shoulder. Bethard stood at the battlements. The named men stumbled out of Logan's way as he strode towards him. You're made of death, bloody nine. You're made of— Logan's fist crunched into his jaw, and he took a flopping step back. Logan's other hand smashed into his cheek, and he reeled against the parapet, a long string of bloody drool running from his split mouth. Logan caught the back of his head and jerked his knee up into Bethod's face, felt his nose crunch flat against it. Logan tangled his fingers in Bethod's hair, gripped it tight, pulled his head up high, and rammed it down into the stones. Die! he hissed. Bethod jerked, gurgled, Logan lifted his head and drove it down again and again. The golden ring flew off his broken skull, bounced across the rooftop with a merry jingling. Die! Bone crunched and blood shot out over the stone in fat drops and thin spatters. Pale as snow and his named men stared, white-faced, helpless and fearful, horrified and delighted. Die, you fucker! And Logan hauled Bethod's ruined corpse into the air with one last effort and flung it tumbling over the battlements. He watched it fall. He watched it crunch to the ground and lie on its side, arms and legs stuck out awkwardly, fingers curled as if they were grasping at something, the head no more than a dark smear on the hard earth. All the faces of the crowds of men standing below were turned towards that corpse. Then, slowly, eyes and mouths wide open, they lifted up to stare at Logan. Cromachy Fail, standing in their midst, in the center of the shaved circle beside the great body of the feared, slowly raised his long arm, the fat forefinger on the end of it pointing upwards. The bloody nine! he screamed. King of the Northman! Logan gaped down at him, panting for breath, legs wobbling, trying to understand. 
The fury was gone and left nothing but terrible tiredness behind it. Tiredness and pain. King of the Northman! Someone shrieked way back in the crowd. No! croaked Logan, but no one heard him. They were all too drunk with blood and fury, or busy thinking what was easiest, or too scared to say any different. The chants broke out all over, first a trickle of them, then a flow, and then a flood, and all Logan could do was watch, clinging to the bloody stone and trying not to fall. The Bloody Nine! King of the Northman! Pale as snow was down on one knee beside him, spots of Bethod's blood sprayed across the white fur on his coat. He always had been one to lick whatever ass was nearest, but he wasn't alone. They were all kneeling, up on the walls and down on the grass. The dogman's Carls and Bethod's, the men who'd held the shields for Logan, and the ones who'd held the shields for the feared. Maybe Bethod had taught them a lesson. Maybe they'd forgotten how to be their own men, and now they needed someone else to tell them what to do. No, whispered Logan, but all that came out was a dull slurp. He had no more power to stop it than he had to make the sky fall in. Seemed to him, then, that men do pay for the things they've done all right, but sometimes the payment isn't what they expected. The bloody nine! roared Crummock again as he sank down on his knees and lifted up his arms towards the sky. King of the Northman!